Hi, so in this video what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you an introduction to problem structuring methods. Uh, just give you a sense of, of the sort of problems that they're oriented to and the sort of uh, consultancy work that they're intended for. So let's get into it. So if we think about the nature of the problems that, that problem structuring methods are, are meant for, then we're, we're looking at unstructured problems, we're looking at complex situations and we're looking at strategic thinking. So we're not sort of looking at very specific operations like, like we might do in traditional operational research. We're looking to, to, to be dealing with big, complex issues and, and uh, the sort of strategic issues that the organisations have to deal with all the time. Now, unlike traditional operational research, we also are assuming that we're going to be working with a group of people, not working individually on our own on our computer. We're going to be in a workshop environment with a group of people who will have uh, lots of different ideas and different points of view. Uh, we also assume that that group of uh, people would benefit from facilitation by the practitioner to, to, to manage and control the process of, of problem solving. And the tools that we use uh, in problem structuring methods are conceptual tools. So they, they are not generally quantitative methods, they are more uh, tools which help us think about uh, things. Uh, so I've got a few nice quotes here from Mingers and Rosenhead who wrote the book uh, Rational Analysis for a Problematic World which is a, a great uh, uh, collection of problem structuring methods. So unstructured problems are seen to involve multiple stakeholders, multiple perspectives, conflicting interests, various types of uncertainties and significant intangibles. And PSMs offer a way of representing the situation that will enable participants to clarify their predicaments, converge on a potentially actionable mutual problem or issue within it, and agree on commitments that will at least partially resolve it. I also want to make a distinction between two types of consultancy. So if we think of traditional consultancy, we often refer to it as expert consultancy. And that's where a consultant is brought into a situation because they are an expert in something. So for example, an accountant being an expert um, in the law about uh, reporting, a uh, solicitor being an expert in terms of of the legal system and um, an OR analyst would be regarded as an expert in, in quantitative analytics. Uh, and this is the dominant form of consultancy and, and, and it still is. However, through the 90s, um, con consultancy firms and organisations realised that with strategic consultancy, uh, expert consultancy wasn't always the most effective because um, organisations felt that external people perhaps didn't have enough insight into their unique business model and also uh, the implementation of strategic uh, initiatives became difficult when those initiatives came from outside of the organisation. So a new type of consultancy developed called process consultancy which is really about the assumption that a group of people are can, can solve their own problems but they need facilitation and they need a well um, developed and reliable process to go through in order to, to, to reach agreement. Now, a, a couple more uh, underlying assumptions about problem structuring methods. And, and the first is they all uh, take seriously the notion that people have different frames um, and that those different frames or points of view determine how we view problems but also how we solve problems. Um, and that uh, groups benefit from having uh, a, a well-developed process and, and a set of tools which helps them to expose those frames and, and make those frames explicit and help people converge together uh, to, to problem solve and, 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 and agree things together. Uh, and that people find it quite difficult to do that without the use of tools. And the second underlying assumption is that what tends to happen in, in, in practice and meetings is that managers will often, uh, w when they come together, want to get on with the business of making choices and making action plans uh, and actually 
uh, they'll often say, you know, Giles, look, I don't think we really need to do this problem structuring methods. We know what the issues are. Can we just get on with making choices? Uh, but actually what we found and, and, and all the practitioners in this area have found is that if you can get people to step back and look at the big picture, actually uh, they often change their mind about, about what the problem is uh, or they change the focus of the problem. Uh, and then and, and later on in the project, they will say, I'm really pleased that we did that. We, I'm really pleased that we took that time. So it's really important that we resist that. Now, all of those uh, ideas and assumptions come together uh, in this slide here, which shows the logic of, of the problem structuring methods. Um, uh, so we assume that we start with a complex situation, and that's really important because, um, you know, we assume complexity and, and, and that makes us humble it makes us um, recognize that that we can't fully understand these situations uh, and, and and that sort of uh, gives us a more realistic expectation of what's possible we assume that we're working with a group of people and that those people will have different points of view and different views of the problem situation and different ideas about the problems uh, we take that uh, and, and express it in some form of a mapping uh, method. Um, so we're going to look at different mapping methods uh, later in another video. Uh, and then that leads us into more analytical methods, more modelling methods um, in problem structuring methods, which helps us look forward um, uh, about the future and, 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 and explore alternative ideas about what the future might be. And then all of that leads into a final session, which is discursive, where we say, OK, you know, we've looked at the situation, we've identified issues, we've thought about different ideas for solutions and, and, and future scenarios. What are we actually going to do? And, and, and that final session is all about developing action plans to take the situation forwards. And then that leads to changing the situation. Uh, but we don't assume in problem structuring methods that, that our action plans will, will necessarily make the situation better. You know, we are, we are humble enough to acknowledge that in complex situations, uh, our ideas for improvements actually might not work so well and we might need to go around this loop again uh, to learn our way to, to action, which is actually really effective. So I just, one, one of the difficulties of PSMs, uh, because they're, they're very flexible, they've used, been used by lots of different people in lots of different ways, sometimes it's quite hard to pin them down. So I thought I'd just put a few project scenarios up for you. So the classic project scenario is uh, a practitioner facilitating a group of people in a workshop to solve a problem or develop strategy. So that's the classic PSM scenario. However, I personally have done, uh, recently have done, a lot of what I call strategic coaching, which is where I work one-on-one -on -one with a senior manager in a, in a confidential environment to help them think through uh, their strategy. And PSMs work really, really nicely in that mode because it's a bit more analytical and you can go, uh, you can go into more depth. Applied research is where you use the problem structuring methods as a way of structuring the qualitative data that you're collecting within a project. So um, qualitative research is obviously very common, it's, it's very popular, and PSMs are a great way of structuring that qualitative data. Finally, stakeholder engagement. So um, often in, in the public sector, in, in the policy uh, space, uh, organisations want to collect stake, stakeholder uh, information uh, and views on, on, on various things. And the PSMs are a great way of going out, running workshops, collecting quality data and structuring that data. So there's a few project scenarios for you. Uh, and if we think about a typical project, uh, you might want to think of it in terms of three workshops, where workshop one is where you're looking at the situation and identifying issues, and that's the current situation, and that's when we, we use our mapping tools. And then, Workshop two is where we might be more analytical um, or we might look to the future uh, to develop ideas for the future. And then the final workshop is where you might bring people together and say, OK, you know, based upon all this work that we've been doing, you know, what are we actually going to do? And, and as we go through those three steps, it's important to allow people to reflect on that process because we know that creativity 
uh, is, is more of a subconscious activity. And so uh, people will go away and, and, and the creativity might happen away from the workshops. Uh, and it's also very important that we document these sessions because it's amazing how quickly people will forget, uh, the world moves on. Uh, so it's very important to take photographs and to document all the work because it's, it's remarkable how quickly you can forget what happens in a workshop. So that's the first video. Uh, that's just a general introdu introduction to PSMs. We'll look at more of the, the details and the tools in other videos.